Hi, everybody. Welcome to the um, second episode in our three-part Marine Mammal Identification Masterclass series. Um, we're really, really glad you're here. This masterclass is actually kind of a first for us and a bit of an experiment um, in terms of trying to gauge whether people are interested in more in-depth um, offerings from our scientists. So again, really happy to see you and excited to welcome you to using iNaturalist to document marine mammals. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce your speakers for today. Dr. Rebecca Johnson and Allison Young, co-directors of our Center for Biodiversity and Community Science. Hi, you two. Hello. Hi. 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 Welcome. Welcome. Um, thank you so much for doing this. This is um, this is great. And I want to let people who are watching know that you can um, ask questions at any time um, using the YouTube chat. And if you haven't used YouTube before, it's going to prompt you just to kind of register um, in order to be able to use that chat. But it's a really, really fast and easy process. And then you'll just be able to talk to us freely. Um, and I'm going to ask all the questions that come in at the end of the session. So stay tuned to hear yours. Um, and with that, I am going to give you your slides and get out of here. We'll see you at the end. Thanks so much. Thanks, Laurel. Thanks, Laurel. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in to the second uh, session in this masterclass about using iNaturalist to document marine mammals. Um, I wanna put a quick disclaimer at the beginning of this talk that we are, not very many, but we are gonna show some photos of dead marine mammals um, because that's the most likely way you're going to encounter uh, a, a marine mammal that you can take a photo with with your phone is maybe when you're walking on the beach and find them. Um, and so we have some examples in here. Um, so just be aware that they're kind of later on, there's going to be a few photos of um, dead marine mammals. They're not super gory, though, but just wanted to let folks know. Um, so I'm Allison, I'm one of the co-directors for the Center of Biodiversity and Community Science, along with Rebecca, um, who is on this call also. Um, and we also want to let you all know that we are not experts in marine mammals. <laughs> That's not the work that we do. Um, our center is really focused on um, getting people out into nature and connecting people to nature and, you know, doing events and building community around nature um, with the goal of having people document their local biodiversity. Um, and so what we do know a lot is how to use iNaturalist. We use it all the time in our work. It's the way we get people to actually collect data for our program um, is through using iNaturalist. And so that's the reason we're giving this talk um, is because we are um, pretty good with iNaturalist. <laughs> um, but we all we are also both marine biologists, um, but we don't focus on marine mammals. Um, we focus on uh, the tide pools, so mostly uh, marine invertebrates and algae. Um, and we do do our community science program in the tide pools, um, where we do have folks use iNaturalist out there. So uh, we have some long-term monitoring that we do, as well as um, hold events and then bio blitzes and things like that in the tide pool. So just to give you some examples of the, the work that we do, um, we have a long-term monitoring project at this place called Pillar Point. If you're local in the Bay Area, it's just north of Half Moon Bay. It's where the Maverick Surf Contest happens, where we do kind of that traditional, like what you might think of what a scientist does in the tide pools, where we actually we work with volunteers and we, um, you know, we count things, we identify things, and we write things down on data sheets. Um, and that's part of the work that we do. Um, but also when we're out in the tide pools with volunteers, we also have a chunk of time dedicated to just exploring and searching and actually just taking photos of things and using iNaturalist um, at, at Pillar Point and also at the other places that we do our work as well. Um, and so what the, what this means is that over the, actually we've been working out at Pillar Point now for almost 10 years um, and we've been working with volunteers there to, you know, take photos on iNaturalist, help us understand what's out there. Um, when we first started working at uh, Pillar Point, there wasn't even a species list for this place. But the great thing about using iNaturalist is that it actually helps us build not only a species list, um, but also a species atlas. So all those little points that you see on the map, you can see there's over 25,000 observations that we and our volunteers and other people have made out at this one tide pool site um, out near Half Moon Bay. Um, and all those little dots are actually individual observations of where someone saw a cool species, took a photo of it, um, and then uploaded it to iNaturalist. And so not only does it give us a species list, it also actually kind of gives us a species atlas of where on the reef things are occurring and when they show up on the reef, you know, some things only are there seasonally and things like that as well. Um, and so this is one of the ways that we use iNaturalist in our work is to help us, um, you know, kind of track changes on the reef through time, build these species lists, understand where on the reef uh, species are, are being found and when they show up as well. Um, we also use iNaturalist to help 
do things like tracking species health and diseases. Um, so by taking photos of things, we were actually able to uh, document sea star wasting disease when it showed up on our coast um, starting in like 2014. Um, so you can see some photos there of uh, wasted sea stars that have the disease. Um, but we were also able to, to then track the recovery um, from sea star wasting disease as well. And again, by take, having these photos, we can go through and look and we can see, you know, which stars have the disease, which stars look healthy. We were able to uh, track a bunch of little baby stars when they were showing up as well to kind of start the recovery of the process out on the reef. And one of the other things that we use iNaturalist for is actually track, uh, track fluctuations in species ranges. Um, so when uh, environmental conditions change on our coast, uh, like back kind of between 2014 and 2016, we were having some marine heat waves. There was that warm water blob that was sitting out there in the ocean that meant that here in the Bay Area, our water was actually much warmer than usual. And so what that what that uh, allowed to happen was that southern species, species that you would normally find down like in Southern California, actually started moving northward up the coast and were showing up here in the Bay Area. Uh, for example, this amazing sea slug. This is a nudibranch called the Hopkins rose, Okinia rosacea. Um, this is a sea slug that, you know, in normal years, in like normal uh, water temperature years, we might see this maybe once or twice in a whole year of going out to this reef and monitoring. Um, and back during uh, the 2014-2016 heat wave in El Nino, um, this became the most common uh, nudibranch out at Pillar Point where we were, which was really unusual. Um, so we are able to use that iNaturalist data that we and our volunteers collect to actually track these changes through time as well. So what we're really excited to talk to you guys today about um, is how you can also use iNaturalist to actually track marine mammal health and diseases as well. Um, our colleagues uh, here at the Academy part of, who are part of the Marine Mammal Stranding Network are really excited to get more people involved in actually documenting marine mammals that you might find while you're out on the coast to help them with the research that they do and understanding um, how our marine mammal, mammal populations are doing. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca to talk specifically about, well, how do you actually use iNaturalist to do this? Great. Thank you so much, Allison. So, okay, the platform that we use to do our work is called iNaturalist. Allison's mentioned it a bunch of times. So you might be asking yourself, what is iNaturalist? So iNaturalist is an app and a website, and it's a place for you, for anyone, to share observations of things that they see in the natural world. So next, Allison. So you can do a lot of things with iNaturalist, but the, at its basic, basic core, you, anyone, takes a picture uh, using a phone. You can also use cameras, but we're gonna talk mostly about phones today. So with your phone, you take a picture of a living thing or evidence of a living thing. So a shell or a leaf, um, anything that is living or evidence of it. And because you're using your phone, you can see here, it tells you, the, it knows your location, it knows where you were, and it allows you to make an observation. And your observations can be really just like a, a nature journal, like things that I saw. So you can see here in the third screen, you can see a list. This is from Allison's um, profile. And you can see a list of all the things that she has seen. So you can use it to take pictures, to document and keep a record of what, what you found. Then you can have a list of what you've seen always and forever. And then you can also use it to see what other people have seen around you by using this explore tab. So you can see the, the screen with all the dots. You can be standing at your local park or your local beach and pull it up and see what is see what have people seen around me? Have people seen nudibranchs or sea slugs? Have people seen sea stars? Have people seen um, different flowers that I might be interested in? You can use it kind of as a guide. And when um, you take a picture, so here's an example of how it actually works. So the first frame, you can see this picture. This is of a slug, a sea slug. Take a picture of it, and then you can see the details. It says what it is. We don't know yet. It's unknown. But this picture was taken on May 1st, 2021. It has a date and the time. It has a location because your phone will geolocate you. And then if you don't know what this is, that's OK. You just need to take a clear photo of your observation. And you can click that view suggestions where it says unknown view suggestions. And iNaturalist will give you suggestions for your identification. So you can see here, it has a list of identifications. 
It says, we're pretty sure this is in the genus Peltadorus. And then it has some top suggestions, a sea lemon, a Monterey Dorid. Um, and you can see that underneath those suggestions, it says it's visually similar and seen nearby. So those are the, the best ones to pick if, you have, if you're having to choose because you want things that are look like what you, you saw and are, have been seen nearby. So in it's suggesting Peltadorus, like I know that this is a Peltadorus, I can click see lemon, you hit, and then you choose that one and you hit share to upload it to iNaturalist. But the beauty is so that the artificial intelligence, the machine learning is what is making that suggestion. It's built into the app. But that machine learning is built on the observations and the identifications that the iNaturalist community has made. So here's a, just a little smattering of the like million people that um, make iNaturalist work. So those that machine learning is built on real pictures that have been identified by real people. And even though you can make a selection from the machine learning or the um, that it, the, the app suggests for you, the community helps you confirm that identification later. So even when I said, this is a sea lemon, I'm like, yes, this is a sea lemon. You can see down here, Allison said this was a sea lemon and two more people confirmed that identification. And they don't always have to confirm it, right? So if I knew this, I'm like, wait, that actually isn't what Allison said. You can disagree with that, um, that identification and it's always dynamic. And so, you know, like Allison said, I'm a marine biologist, but I've learned so much about plants and other terrestrial life um, by using iNaturalist and doing this kind of work, because sometimes you make a wrong identification or you can't identify something all the way and the community will help you. And then you learn from the community. But once people have agreed on what you saw that this, yes, this is a nudibranch called a sea lemon, that observation becomes what's called research grade. And to become research grade, it has to have all of these things that you can see in this checkbox. It has to have a date, a location, a photo, or some evidence. You can also upload sounds for things that make sounds, mostly birds, um, but some other things make sounds that you can upload. Um, and then it's supported by the community. And then sometimes there are other things that people can, can downgrade, can say, actually, you know, I'm not sure this is right, that like, or, that this date looks a little weird. And so anyone can um, edit those, but really this core of these things are what your observation needs to be research grade. And once an, uh, well, and when we're making those observations, we're sharing, like all of this is opened and freely accessible for anyone to use. And so far, there have been almost 85 million observations made and shared by almost 2 million people on iNaturalist. So you're making this species list for yourself, right? You're just finding out what things are, like, what is this spider in my bathtub? What is this tree that I always see the leaves of when I'm walking down my street? So the kind of beauty of iNaturalist is you can use it however you want, right? You are learning for yourself. You're building this list. You're understanding the places you visit, the places that you live better. But you're also contributing to this global database of when and where species are found. And this is hugely important for science and conservation. All right. So talked a lot about how iNaturalist works. How do you use it best if you want to take pictures of marine mammals? So remember I said you need to take a clear photo so someone can identify it. So that's kind of pretty easy if you can get close enough up, up to a sea slug or close to a spider because you can get the whole thing in one picture. But to help marine mammal experts identify marine mammals, it's really important to have a, a set of photos. So the first thing you want is a photo of the entire animal. Okay, if it's dead on the beach, you can get pretty close and do these things. If the animal is swimming and live and you just have your phone, like try your best to get a good photo. You can still upload it. This is really focusing on dead um, marine mammals here to get these parts of the animal. You should never get close enough to a live marine mammal to take all these photos, right? So you want to be stay away from live marine mammals. So when you, you want a picture of the whole animal, you want a picture of the face and the head. 
If you can see the teeth, that's great. Teeth are, teeth are great to help identify. And this is just for seals and sea lions I'm talking about right now. Um, and you wanna, when you're taking a picture of the head, you wanna make sure you get the area where the ears are, are visible or not visible. So if there's a little ear flap or not, that's really, really important. You wanna take a picture of the front flippers and the hind flippers. So if you can get all four of those photos, so you can add more than four, but if you can get all four of those photos, you'll have like what people need to identify seals and sea lions. So we have an example. So here's a, an observation of a stellar sea lion. So you can see here's a whole animal um, and you can see the, all of its parts. You can see the head, you can see where its little ears are. You can see its teeth. And then there's a picture here of the four flippers. And there are some others. You can see the picture of the, the hind flippers as well. So this is like a fabulous observation to let folks like our Marine Mammal Stranding Network team and other marine mammal experts um, help identify um, this that this is a stellar sea lion and not a California sea lion um, or not something that looks kind of similar. All right, so if you happen to find a dolphin or a porpoise or a whale on the beach, a little bit rarer if you're up in Northern California, but it does happen. Um, so you want to do the same thing. You want to take a picture of the whole animal. So this is a huge whale. This might be hard. So you can like take it from a few angles. Then you want the face and the head, just like for the seal, seals and sea lions, and the teeth or baleen, right? So some whales have baleen and some have teeth. The flippers, the dorsal fin, and the tail fluke. So these are the parts that are important to document. All right, so here's an example of a long beach common dolphin observation on iNaturalist. So you can see this is like the head, almost the whole animal. You can see it was probably bitten by something, but which is also important for us to understand um, how things have died. But you can see the whole head, the teeth. You can see the fluke. Um, and then here's the whole animal. You can see it's actually bitten in a part. Um, and this would really help the Marine Mammal Stranding Network, the folks that, that really wanna understand where marine mammals are, where marine mammals are dying and how they died. So this observation helps us, helps them know where these animals are and what's where, but it also is like a really good clue for them to go out and look and um, take the parts of this animal to help um, understand what's happening. All right, so there are some other marine mammals, mostly he's talking about along the California coast here. A sea otter, like obviously like one of the, the cutest ever, so I had to have a picture of it. So we have sea otters along the California coast. They don't often get further north um, than San Mateo County, but they can sometimes. But they often are confused for another otter that we can see along our coast, which is a river otter. I think there's a picture of um, so here's, it's, I don't have a whole picture of a river otter. I should have had a cute little river otter um, next to it, but we can see river otters along our coast. Um, and at first, I've been confused at first, like up in far Northern California, seeing what looks like an otter and thinking that I made this amazing find that I saw, saw a sea otter in Mendocino County, which hasn't been seen in a very long time. Um, but it's often a river otter. And so there's some ways that you can tell them apart. And there's some examples here but mostly like the river otters have this really, really long tail um, and the sea otters have this are a little fuzzier, have a shorter tail and the way they walk on land and the way they swim in the ocean is really different. And you can usually from one picture of a living animal, we can tell the difference. And we have an example of a sea otter observation um, of a dead sea otter on the coast with those same kind of photos that you want so really the whole animal and the, the tail are some of the most important parts for sea otters. Um, and then the teeth too. And this is an amazing photo because here you can see this, the teeth of the, the sea otter and you can see that they're purplish because this sea otter was eating um, sea, purple sea urchins and it turns their teeth uh, purple. So it's kind of an amazing like natural history thing that you can um, take evidence of as well. So if you see a dead marine mammal on the beach, you should take pictures using iNaturalist as we just described, but you should also call this hotline. So if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can call this number, this 415 number here. And we have some references for you to, to see these later so you don't have to remember them <laughs> right now. But you wanna call also 
if you're anywhere on the US West Coast, there's a marine mammal stranding hotline that you can call. So uploading it to iNaturalist is important, but also um, making these calls is um, the, the thing you should always do in combination. All right, so we've talked a lot about like how to take pictures of marine mammals, how iNaturalist works, but, and how you can all these data are open and available on iNaturalist. But we wanted to talk a little bit about how these data are used. So all of the data. So the immediate data, you know, if I found a whale at the beach out on, you know, in San Francisco, I know that I can take a picture, upload it to iNaturalist, call that marine mammal stranding hotline. Someone will come out, they'll investigate how that whale died, do a necropsy, take pieces back to the California Academy of Sciences to help understand our changing oceans and what's happening to, to whales and dolphins and or seals and sea lions. So that's like an immediate use of the data, but all these data used together make this incredible um, big data. So all of the research grade observations on iNaturalist are shared with what's called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And this is a global clearinghouse of data on where what species are found where when. So if someone was starting a research project on gray whales on the coast of California and wanted to know where they were seen in the past and where they're seen now, GBIF is a really good place to go because it has all of Natural History Museum data and iNaturalist data and other data all together. All right, and those data are used by scientists to write papers. So just in 2020, over almost three, 400 papers were written using iNaturalist data. And that's amazing. Like, that's a lot of scientific work. But to me, like the coolest part about that is that I could have been walking down the street and taking a picture of a butterfly or taking a picture of a whale at the beach. And I don't even know how those data will be helpful for science, but they are used. And so data that all of us take and share on iNaturalist are used to further our understanding of biodiversity and our changing planet in ways that we can't even imagine. And that's really exciting. And so that's like the big picture. And we talked about the, the marine mammals, but also if you have people out on the beaches or anywhere in the world, um, taking pictures of cool things that they find, we find unexpected things and we get to know about them and share them. So in the past, like unexpected finds, you know, if someone found this, like you can see this guy, he found this gigantic fish on the beach in Santa Barbara. You know, 20 years ago, he would have called the Natural History Museum or emailed someone. And like the discovery of this really interesting find would have been limited to just a few experts and no one would really know about it. And if he wasn't someone who knew how to call a Natural History Museum or knew how to email, maybe no one would have known about this find. So this guy, his name's Tom Lee Turner, he saw this big fish on the beach in Santa Barbara. He took a bunch of pictures of it, uploaded it to, uploaded it to iNaturalist. And many of you might kind of immediately recognize this fish and be like, oh, I think this is a mola mola. This is like an ocean sunfish. And that's what he thought. It's like a huge, it's a pretty common offshore fish. It looks like half a fish. They're amazing. Um, so he uploaded it as a common mullet. And you can see a conversation, conversation ensued on iNaturalist. So he's like, wait, someone's like, I'm not sure if that's what it is. Could you take some more photos? So he went back, he uploaded a bunch more photos. And this conversation just kind of connected, this observation was connected to a bunch of different experts. So folks um, who work in New Zealand and the Southern part of the Southern hemisphere, folks that are um, the collection managers for fish collections, a woman who actually described a new species of mola saw this observation and was like, I am pretty sure this is not a common mola, but this is this thing called a common hoodwinker mola that I just described, you know, a couple of years ago, this is a new species. And so everyone's explaining they're like, holy mola, this is amazing. We can't believe this find. And I mean, it's kind of cool, right, to find a newly described species. But the reason that people were really, really amazed, so here you can see it's a hoodwinker mola, not the common mola. The reason people were so amazed is that before this finding, that species had only been known from the Southern Hemisphere. This was the first observation in the Northern Hemisphere off the coast of Santa Barbara. 
So this is a huge new, uh, gives us a huge new understanding of the distribution of this fish. And interestingly, since this finding, this fish has been seen both alive off the coast of California and washed up again. So now the thinking is maybe this species was has been here for a very long time, but it was just confused um, for this other mola. And so we were missing this. And so this is just all started from one person's observation. So who knows what your observation can contribute to science? All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Allison to talk more about marine mammals and how those data are used. Awesome, thanks Rebecca. Yeah, so Rebecca described a little bit about, you know, when you take a photo, um, on iNaturalist of a, of a marine mammal you find on the coast. And especially if you call, you know, the, our San Francisco Bay Area number or uh, the West Coast Stranding Network number, like kind of the immediate use uh, or the immediate response is that usually someone will go out to the coast and they will do some sort of necropsy and take some samples to try to figure out, um, you know, what, what caused this animal to die, uh, basically. Um, and so that's a really amazing thing. This is actually our... Uh, uh, ornithology and mammalogy collections manager, um, Mo Flannery, um, who gave the first masterclass session um, earlier this week um, out doing a necropsy on what I believe to be an elephant seal. That's what it looks like to me. It's a pretty big, <laughs> pretty big animal right there. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, well, you know, so you know, what that one observation can tell them something really interesting, but what about all these observations together? You know, when they get um, lots of iNaturalist observations of marine mammals, when they can go out and actually do uh, necropsies and, and understand how, you know, how the health of our marine mammals are doing as a whole. Um, so uh, the Marine Mammal Stranding Network does publish their data, um, you know, the results of the data. Uh, the most recent uh, publication, at least that I found, was um, from their stranding data from 2007 to 2000, uh, 20, 2016. Um, and you can see, you know, so the West Coast Stranding Network is actually not just in California. It also goes up through Oregon and Washington as well. So um, this is just about uh, cetaceans, large cetaceans, so basically whales um, that were stranded on the coast between 2007 and 2016. Um, and so one of the things you can do is you can kind of just see like what are the most common species uh, that tend to strand along, along the West Coast, um, washing up dead. And so you can see in California and actually Oregon, Washington as well, it's mostly gray whales, but there's other species as well. So that's something they can do is just kind of look at the population as a whole. Those animals that wash up on our coast are a subset of the larger population. So you can kind of understand the size of these populations um, by uh, knowing the number of animals that wash up. Um, they also track things like seasonality. So when are those animals washing up um, along the coast? And you can see it's slightly different for the peak of gray whales versus humpback whales. So they can investigate that. You know, is it like the food source when they're when our food is closer to the coast, or is it when they're you know doing their big migrations and some of them are um, you know getting sick or starving or things like that? They can track that, those sorts of things as well. Um, and this is a really interesting one as well. When they go out and do these necropsies, they can see if there's any evidence of human interaction. Um, and in most cases, you can see there's not. That, that little red slice is the human action runs, but they can actually then try to determine um, for those ones that did have some human interaction, what, what was that interaction? And you can see um, uh, along the, for a lot of large whales um, along the coast, um, there's fishery interactions. So they might be getting like entangled in, in um, fishing nets or crab pot lines or things like that. Um, but you also see that there's uh, vessel collisions as well. So actually getting um, hit by ships um, is a common uh, or not relative, not super common for whales as a whole, but for those ones that have human interaction, getting hit by ships is something that does happen. And so this is kind of a cool, uh, if they can take this sort of information, and in some cases, some cases they're just using this information to track, like I said, the health and the populations of marine mammals. But in some cases, they've been actually able to use this data to actually uh, change management policies um, along our coast. So uh, they were able to actually hear off of the San Francisco Bay Area in the Greater Farallones National Marine Sanctuary actually change the shipping lines. They could see kind of where the whales were and where the ships were coming in and actually change the shipping lanes and make ships have to stay in these certain lanes that seem to have fewer whales in them based on where their food sources are to help reduce those ship strikes. So that's kind of a cool interaction, you know, where it could be like an individual, the, the kind of that chain of that individual observations, people calling in their strandings, that you take that data as a whole to kind of understand what's going on with these populations. Um, and in some cases, we can actually try to make some changes, at least in our behavior, harder to change the behavior of the whales. <laughs> but in our behavior, we can make, we can uh, do some make some changes to help keep our populations healthier as a whole. 
So we've talked a lot about dead marine mammals um, because that is definitely the, like we were saying, the easiest thing, the things that you're most likely going to encounter when you're out walking along the beach um, is a dead marine mammal. And those are the things that are easy to take photos of. Um, but you are more than welcome if you find some live marine mammals, you know, if you see some uh, awesome whale, you know, jumping off, uh, jumping out of the water, or you happen to go to uh, Anya Nuevo and you're able to see these elephant seals, you're more than welcome to uh, upload your live marine mammals. There's, um, besides the Marine Mammal Stranding Network, there's whole other groups of folks that actually track the health of, of live marine mammals. It, the taken together, those live and those dead ones actually are what tell, tells us uh, how healthy our populations are. So you're more than welcome to upload live marine mammals to iNaturalist. Um, we do want to say, though, that um, if you do find um, a sick or an injured or an entangled marine mammal, um, you can contact the Marine Mammal Center. Uh, and we have their phone number right there. Um, and you can see that that first photo, the one on the left, is actually really hard to tell what that is because it is actually illegal to approach um, a sick or injured or entangled uh, marine mammal. So this was actually a little uh, fur seal that we found actually when we were out doing one of our tide pool surveys. You can actually see it's in the tide pools. Um, and so I took this photo with my phone from very, very far away, which is why it looks so blurry. Uh, but we called the Marine Mammal Center and they were able to respond and they were able to uh, capture this seal and actually take it to the Marine Mammal Center to get that net off of its neck um, and see if they could uh, you know, help it recover. Um, and so we were able to take a photo of it in the crate that they used to carry it out um, once they had captured it as well. Um, so we have a resource. Um, there's actually a whole list of different uh, agencies you can contact to pay based on the marine mammal, like the type of marine mammal you're finding and if it's dead or if it's sick or if it's just alive. Um, so I think Laurel can put this um, bit.ly link uh, in the chat for you. So you don't actually have to scribble all those numbers down. This is just a resource that um, if you click that link, you can, uh, have this whole resource that shows you that list of who you should contact when you find marine mammals um, on the coast. Um, and we also have this great resource that we actually just developed, which is, is, is basically about how do you use iNaturalist on the coast uh, to document there's marine mammals, to, to you know, send in your, your reportings and your findings as well. Um, so basically this covers a lot of what we talked about today. Um, it has instructions for you know, what should you do um, to use iNaturalist? How do you use iNaturalist? It has the phone numbers for who you should call um, if you do find um, a marine mammal out there. So taking your photos and putting them up on iNaturalist, but also calling in your finding as well. It has those um, diagrams of what photos you should take. Um, and then also has uh, some common marine mammals of the uh, California coast as well. So hopefully if you attended Mo's masterclass session, um, uh, earlier this week, you were able to kind of start to get that introduction of how do you tell these uh, different marine mammals apart, but this is a little guy that will also help you do that as well. So if you're interested in um, getting that, I think Laurel just put that link in the chat there. Um, you can download this as a PDF um, and keep it printed out, have it on your computer as a reference, uh, things like that as well. Um, if you're interested in you getting even deeper into marine mammal identification, especially those tricky ones that when you do find a dead marine mammal on the coast, um, you know, sometimes if they're fresh, they're relatively easy to tell what they are. But if they were, you know, eaten by something or if they've been out there for a while, it's a little bit harder. Um, and so Sue uh, Pemberton, who also works in our ornitholo ornithology and mammalogy uh, department here, she uh, helps run the Marine Mammal Stranding Network for the, for the Academy. She's going to do kind of a sleuthing uh, masterclass. It's the final masterclass next week. Um, she will do a sleuthing where you can... Uh, try to uh, hone those skills for how do you know, how do you actually tell what something is um, when it's not immediately obvious. Um, we also have other resources uh, on our website as well that I can see that um, Laurel has put in the chat. Um, there's, if you wanna do some more learning on your own, we have uh, an advanced marine mammal identification course that's virtual that you can do on your own. Um, so there's a link for the course itself. There's also resources for that course too, if you just wanna have more resources about um, identifying marine mammals um, as well, you can get those off of our website also. Um, and finally, um, this is very short notice, but if you're interested in trying out iNaturalist 
with us <laughs> to be there to answer your questions if you want. We are actually, we're going to be doing tide pool stuff. So um, although sometimes there's harbor seals that hang out at the end of these tide pools, so there might be some marine mammals uh, in the area. Um, but if you are interested in getting out to the coast and using iNaturalist um, and helping in the research that Rebecca and I do, like I said, on marine invertebrates instead of marine mammals, we are actually doing a bio blitz at Pillar Point, which is our main, um, main study site tomorrow. Um, and we have a uh, link that I think uh, Laurel can put into the chat for you that shows where we're going to be meeting. Pillar Point's interesting because there's multiple parking areas and also sometimes it's very busy. Um, but we're going to be in the main parking area by the bathrooms from about 4 to 4, 15 p.m. That's where Rebecca and I will be. So if you're there um, by that time and you want to come and meet us, we actually will also have physical copies of that um, iNaturalist Guide for Marine Mammals that we can give you as well. Um, but we will walk out to the reef with you. Um, if you end up getting there earlier or later, you can just look for us out on the reef. Um, the fun thing that we're doing tomorrow is not only trying to document a whole bunch of stuff out on the reef um, using iNaturalist, um, but also we're going to be out there during sunset and a little bit beyond. And there are really cool organisms that fluoresce under UV light uh, once it gets dark. And so we will be out there with some UV lights. Um, after sunset, we'll be turning on those UV lights. You can also try to find us that way by the blue glow of our UV lights and um, checking out some fluorescing uh uh, marine invertebrates as well. Um, so join us if you can. We'd love to see you. Um, so with that, uh, we just want to say thanks to everyone who attended. Uh, we have our both of our Twitter uh, accounts here where you can reach us and also on iNaturalist. Our, that little green, the green bird is the iNaturalist logo bird. Um, that's who we are on iNaturalist if you're interested in um, connecting with us there. Uh, we have a few more resources about the work that we do about our marine mammal stranding network and also iNaturalist.org, which is the um, web version of, of iNaturalist as well. So with that, we are done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so, so much. That was fantastic. Um, we've got a good number of viewers out there. Uh, they're unusually quiet today, so maybe still pondering. So if you do have questions for Rebecca and Allison, go ahead and just add them in the chat. Um, but one, from, one clarifying question from Denise, who asks, um, just can you talk a bit more about do you take the photos through the iNAT app or can you use your camera and upload later, for example, if you don't have cell reception? Yeah, for sure. So I'm happy to answer this. So you if there are a couple different ways to use the iNaturalist on your phone. I'll talk about that first. So you can open up the iNaturalist app and take photos through the app. You can also use your phone's camera and take photos and then load those into iNaturalist using by looking through your photo library. So to do that, obviously you don't need cell service because your phone camera will work. You wanna make sure though, before you do either of those things, that your settings um, mark your location on your photos. So however you do that in Android or iPhone, you know how to do that. Make sure your location services are turned on for your camera and also for iNaturalist. Um, you can just make it so while you're using the app, so you don't have to use it all, all the time. So, the, so to just reiterate, on your phone, there are two ways. One is through the iNaturalist app, and then one is by using your photo library and loading those into the iNaturalist app later. And then if you have a camera, you can take pictures using a digital camera, and then later when you get home to your desktop computer, you can, however you want to get those photos from your memory card, whether it's putting it into your computer, if you have a camera that automatically loads them onto your computer, you can upload those um, onto iNaturalist. For the thing is, is that most digital cameras do not mark your location onto your photo. Some do, but not all do. So you will have to edit the location of those photos and it's easy to do. You can just drop a pin like you would on a Google map and say, this is where I was when I took these photos. You might have to dig around in the settings a little bit, but there are awesome guides on iNaturalist that tell you how to do this um, if you go to the help section at the about section, the help section of my naturalist um, that will tell you how to do that. Or, you know, we use, um, for our underwater cameras that we use in the intertidal, they automatically mark the location, which is amazing if you're like invested and really want to do that. Um, it's an amazing feature. Um, um, so I guess if you wanted, different ways. Oh yeah, sorry. I was just going to ask if you wanted to get really, really nerdy about it too, but you had a camera that didn't do that. There are kind of GPS um, things you can buy things maybe you can do better than me today, but um, <laughs> that will give you the, the latitude and longitude to a, to a really exacting degree too. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. For okay. sure. Allison has one of those. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. What's the, so if you're not saying thing, what are they called again? In case someone wants to Google? <laughs> well, there's a few, so you can actually just have like a GPS unit if you okay. want, like the unit itself. There's also something, um, there's a cool tracker you can put on your phone that actually tracks like your, uh, as you're walking, it attracts the, the time and where you were. And you, there's, I can't remember what the program is, but there's a program you can sync your photos with yeah. that tracker and it will mm-hmm. automatically add. It says, okay, your photo was taken at like 1130 in the morning and here's where you were at 1130 in the morning. So we're going to add this location to your photo itself, Oh, cool. which is pretty cool also. And that's just something you can have on your phone. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah, um, cool. Mega crazy girl who is also um, a fantastic participant in Mo's just doesn't have a question, but wanted to thank you for, um, for doing this. Thank you for being here um, twice in a row. And then uh, Shanti, I hope I'm saying that right. Asks, um, Oh, this is a good question. So if, if you encounter sea animals, seals in her case, since she's an open water swimmer um, in that way, is it also helpful to call them in? I don't think there's a group that's tracking live seals. Like if they're healthy and they're fine, I don't think you actually have to call anyone. Um, on that resource list that we that we have that bit.ly of that has kind of a list of everybody, there is a group that tracks live whales. So if you, you know, you happen to be out there, I mean, how amazing would it be to, to encounter a whale while you're open water swimming? <laughs> um, but if you're on a beach and you see a whale go by as well, there is a group that's interested in your um uh, when you see a, a live whale out there, but I think that's the only like live, healthy things are totally cool with it. I think that's the only uh, group of organisms that there's a, a contact for. Okay, perfect, so, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned um, you mentioned, for example, ship strikes or just start, you know researchers general you know need to know how when things die they did die. Um, but, but beyond that, are, are there any, um, big questions or issues that you would call out facing Bay area marine mammals that, that, you know, are being kind of actively tracked now in terms of health of populations or, or changes there? Yeah, I would say one thing that, um, you know, Allison mentioned another, um, human interaction problem that leads to the death of, of marine mammals is entanglement in fishing gear. And one of the really interesting kind of positive developments, and maybe for those of you who love to eat crab in the Bay Area, have noticed this over the past few years, that the opening of the crab season has been delayed um, to avoid interactions with whales. So because they entangle in crab pots a lot, um, or they can. So they've delayed, it, the last few years, this year included, they've delayed the start of the crab fishing season to avoid that interaction. So they look and they see like, where are the whales? Like, where are they right now? And if they're still around, um, these are migrating whales, then they um, they don't start the season until later. So that's like a really, I think, interesting positive change that, you know, can be tough on the, on the fishing community, but that's something that they believe in, right? In protecting the health of oceans because healthy oceans lead to healthy crab for everyone. Um, so it's like a, a positive step um, yeah. for sure. Yeah, that's neat. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you want to, sorry, did you want to add anything, Allison, or were you? Well, I mean, also just, um, an interesting thing just to, to keep an eye out for is sometimes you might see, I think it happens to sea lions more often than any other, um, species, but sometimes you might see a sea lion on the beach that looks actually relatively healthy. Like it's like got weight on, it doesn't look like it's starving, but it's acting really weird, like kind of like swaying or actually showing up in places that you wouldn't normally find. So, So sea lions are the animals that they can act the, out of the, seals and sea lions, sea lions can actually walk pretty well so they can travel um, on on land for long distances. And so we've had sea lions show up like on city streets in San Francisco before that have like come mm-hmm. up from the Embarcadero and stuff like that. Um, and they can get, it's a dinoflagellate, right, Rebecca? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we'll basically- We'll come soon, we'll um, next week. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's an organism in the water that actually get into fish and then the sea lions eat the fish and it um, basically gives them this like toxicity poisoning that makes them act very strange. Um, and so if you see a sea lion um, on the beach that like seems, like I said, totally healthy, but still acting really weird, um, that's a great time to call the Marine Mammal Center because they will actually come in and get that sea lion um, and take it to the Marine Mammal Center and basically help kind of flush that toxicity out of its system and hopefully be able to return it back um, out to the wild as well. Wow. So I think I think actually that that's leptospirosis poisoning, which is a bacteria. So oh. and if you have a dog, anyone who has a dog, this is one reason you keep your dogs away from marine mammals and you get them the vaccine for leptospirosis because it also can affect dogs. Um, but yeah, it's a bacteria. Um that makes them do really, really strange stuff. Hmm. Okay. Wow. Thanks for that. Um, 
And I guess just um, ending with kind of a broader um, question about community science, which is in your time in the, you know, co-directing this department or even leading up to that, like, have you seen, I think um, people always wonder if there's a certain type of scientist who, who uses community science data. So I think that's interesting, but also beyond that, are you seeing changes in trends of how and how many scientists do, do use community um, generated data and scientific data in this way or data? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think especially just like with this realization that the amount of data that you can collect, you know, when you in either, you know, that you engage people directly, like you set up a project and you ask people to do something really specific for you. Or if you're interested in kind of the work that we do, which is like kind of this biodiversity data as a whole, this big data, like how our species range is changing along the coast and things like that, um, that more and more people are kind of understanding the power of, of community science and engaging people in documenting um, or collecting data for them. You know, and, and especially uh, there have been more and more advances these days. You know, you can imagine when you go out and take photos with iNaturalist, you're probably not taking photos of every single thing that you see, right? Like you're taking photos probably of the things that look the most interesting. I mean, we do it all the time too. Like we'll go out on big hikes and take photos of wildflowers because that's really, you know, we're excited to see them, but we're like, like grasses, like eh, we're not really going to take photos of those grasses, you know, stuff like that. And so there's been more adva more and more advances these days. And actually, how do you take this kind of messy data set where people are kind of taking photos of what they want, but not necessarily of everything? Um, and how do you kind of like, get rid of that noise and use that data to actually track things like abundance and then ranges and things like that as well. And like, as more and more people are using that sort of data, the advances and basically how to kind of like get rid of the, the biases and the noise are getting better and better as well. Um, and mm -hmm. so I'd say that, you know, especially for things like tracking biodiversity and understanding how species ranges are changing or like changes due to climate change and things like that, um, community science data is becoming hugely important in that work. Mm -hmm. Mm, great. Okay. Rebecca, did you want to add anything? That was pretty good. Answer. Yeah, I mean, I would just 100% agree. And I mean, if I think about the most important papers, recent papers on species range changes along the California coast due to climate change, like they all draw on community science data from iNaturalist. Um, and they wouldn't be able to make the conclusions or have the amount of data, like they wouldn't be able to say the same thing without those data. Um, and another example is like recently there's a big sunflower star that was found off our coast, but it's now been listed as critically endangered by the IUCN. So like the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and the data that were used to understand how many and how widespread these, how where they were before they were hit by this starfish wasting was the biggest data source from, from iNaturalist. Oh. And so these are people who are taking pictures of this amazing starfish who wouldn't have known that first of all, that it was going to be hit by this wasting mm -hmm. disease, but also that how important those data were going to be. Um, and I think like Allison said, the more, um, the more data we have, the better mm -hmm. all of the data collectively are. And the better, the more folks like us, like me and Allison, where this is our job, that we can, you know, instead of having it be hard to collect data on the front end, like you don't have, like being a professional scientist, right? There's a lot of barriers to like how rigorous you have to collect your data, this specific method with transects and quadrants and replicates, you know, that's one way to do science that's critically important. Um, but this other way is that getting as many people as possible to share their observations. And then for us as a different kind of scientist to manipulate and account for all those biases on the back end, um, we can answer different questions. And we've also found through our work that combining that professional data with the community data is, can answer questions that neither of them can answer alone. Um, and so that's kind of another really exciting development for us. Um, I think for the field as a whole is combining those types, types of data. That is really exciting. And it's just a good reminder that like you, you person watching right now, like really, really <laughs> matter and have a lot of power to you know, help drive our understanding of what's happening now and also how we plan for what will happen and what is coming, um, which is also a good segue in saying that Rebecca and Allison are also co-directors of our new Thriving California initiative. And you'll hear a lot more about that and how that work will help California in particular plan um, better and more granularly and more effectively for for the future that lies ahead and also hopefully guarantee a better one. So thank you. Um, I'm going to do some quick housekeeping before I let you go, which is thank you so much, all of you viewers for being here. A reminder that Tuesday, November 9th is our final class in this series. It's called Sleuthing with Sue, Marine Mammal Identification Case Studies. 
um, which will be very cool. It will also be somewhat more graphic and in terms of showing um, animals that have died. And it does build on the knowledge that both Mo and Rebecca and Allison um, generated in the first um, two. So if you've missed um, either of those or you're watching one or the other, you can find them even if they're no longer live. Um, and we have given you a lot, oh, just to say Sue is our curatorial assistant member in the Academy's mammalogy and ornithology department, as well as our marine mammal str stranding coordinator. So that'll be a really um, interesting class. We've given you a lot of resources uh, during this, and we are going to go ahead and drop those in the permanent comment section of this YouTube video since the chat will close when, the, when it's no longer live. Um, however, if you had a question that you didn't get to ask or you're still thinking over, you can also put that in the comment section and we'll work with Rebecca and Allison to get you an answer that way as well. So thank you viewers. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Allison. And um, yeah, hopefully we will see um, you all back on uh, Tuesday. Bye-bye for now. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much everyone. Bye.